You are tuned in to another edition of Americana Music Profiles, brought to you by Americana Rhythm Music Magazine and AmericanaMusicMagazine.com. I'm your host, Greg Tutwiler. Let's jump right in to the next exciting interview. After years of working with and for other artists, Australian musician Rod McCormick decided it was finally time to release a project of his own. Rod is my guest on this edition of Americana Music Profiles as we talk about his debut CD, Fingerprints. Hi Rod, welcome to the show today. How are you, Greg? Good, good. How are you? So uh, we were talking a few minutes ago, you you were fresh in the States from Australia. It's a long trip, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is a long trip. It takes us around about 26 hours to wow. door, pretty much to get to get from our, our, our home in Australia, which is on the central coast, about an hour and a half north of Sydney. And uh, and now I'm sitting here in, in Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, great. How, how long will you be here? I'm here for three weeks, this visit. I, I come here quite a lot, and I have been doing so since about 1990, uh, sorry, 1985 I started coming here. Okay. And... Um, and yes, yeah, so I visit quite a lot and come here to do you know, lots of recording and things like that. But um, yeah, we're here for three weeks and really looking forward to heading over to the IBMA festival. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but uh, if uh, folks uh, hear this and, and afterwards and they, they missed us, we'll make sure that they can find you uh, at the end of the show here. We'll give them a way to get in touch and uh, hopefully uh, right. folks will be able to catch you at the, one of the IBMA uh, showcases as well. That's so, great. I hope yeah. so. Yeah. So um, you are... Um, uh, obviously, as you just mentioned, been traveling back and forth quite a quite a bit for a, a while. Your your career started, uh, I presume, in Australia as a musician, though. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Look, I grew up as a kid in Australia, playing you know lots of music, lots of acoustic music, folk music, and country music, and 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 when I was um, about eleven years old, my father. Um, bought me a banjo and said, "Look, you're kind of finger picking the guitar. Maybe you should check this out." Okay. And and that was that was really great. But you know, one of the he he gave me a couple of vinyl albums back then, and, and um, uh, one of them happened to be a Carl Jackson five string banjo record, which is still a, an incredible piece of work. You yeah. Know? And, yeah. Uh, and and so when I heard. Carl playing, you know, Foggy Mountain Breakdown and those kind of standard things. Plus, he'd written a bunch of tunes for that record. It it was, you know, that sort of got me hooked in. And then I spent several years just discovering, you know, bluegrass because the first time I heard Foggy Mountain Breakdown was Carl Jackson playing it, and yeah. which is an, an, an incredible version. But then I wanted to go back and discover, you know, Lester and Earl and, of course, Bill Monroe. And it right. sort of took me on a, a backward trip going through, you know, to, to figure out all of the... The sort of the the roots of where bluegrass music came from. You also have had the opportunity in your career to play with quite a few uh, country musicians as well, though, right? Yeah, that's true. Look, in Australia, I have a recording studio and I produce a lot of records for people and a lot of Australian artists. Um, and I've also been, as a musician, I play on heaps of records from all over the world and and. Um, uh, and I guess I was the musical director of the Australian CMA Awards for about ten years in a row. Okay. And, um, okay. And and so when we'd have a visiting American artist, then I, I would often get a phone call to say, "Hey, look, you know, Trisha Yearwood's coming to town, and can you put a band together for her?" Oh, cool. For instance, okay. You know. So I did that with people like um, Trisha and uh, Leanne Rhymes and Pam Tillis and. Tracy Lawrence and lots of lots of people like that, and also I've been lucky enough to play in the band for artists like Glenn Campbell and uh, yeah. really terrific, terrific artists, and really lucky to, to get to do that stuff. Obviously, you know they come to Australia and they need to pick up a, a few musicians, and I was lucky that um, you know I play the guitar and banjo and mandolin and stuff, so would often get the call. Yeah, yeah. Outside of that, is is bluegrass more your kind of music of trade, or, or will you play all sorts of things too? Well, look, yeah, I record all sorts of things because that's my studio and that's uh-huh. my 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 job. You know, I produce records in lots of different genres, um, mainly country, mainly acoustic and folk music. That's kind of the things that I that I sort of specialize in. But but I also you know end up recording 
and producing things in all sorts of other areas. My daughter actually has just released an album which is in the electronic market, and, um, and she's doing really well uh, in LA and and, uh, and doing great. So that was really interesting. But yeah, my absolute love, my my real passion lies in acoustic music. Stuff. Um, that's you know, I guess that's when I first heard music. That you know, I think we all know that moment where you hear something that's yeah. just. It's, it's totally life-changing and transforming, you know, and for me that was hearing, um, you know, New Guys Revival and Tony Rice and those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. How, how does the music scenes differ from the States and Australia with regards to the bluegrass industry specifically? Well, with, with bluegrass in Australia, we have, you know, we have a very tiny kind of circuit, but it's... Um, you know, country music in Australia is about six percent of our wholesale music market. Okay. So you can you can imagine how small bluegrass is. Right. Know? Right. And, yeah. And 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 so it's a tiny thing. We have bluegrass awards, like we have, you know, national banjo guitar contests and those kind of things. Mm-hmm. And but it's um it's it's not a huge business, but it's something that people do love. And but I feel like it's it's something you have to you know. You have to come over here and find it. You know, it's it's real hard to find lots of bluegrass in Australia. Yeah, are, are there festivals that that promote it? Um, there are a couple of festivals that are really great, actually, and 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 I feel like there are more and more coming up at the moment. I feel like there's a a bit of a resurgence for organic, sort of rootsy acoustic music in all forms, whether it be folk or sure. Americana or certainly bluegrass as well. And there are a couple of really great little festivals that happen that that um, occasionally will bring some some great American artists over and and people from around the world and. Um, and that's really great, but I do think it's growing in Australia. And and I think, you know, when I started listening to bluegrass, there was no internet. There was, you know, yeah. basically, yeah, I had to order a, a vinyl record, you know, from from the states, and it, it could take up to six months to arrive. Back then. Really, wow! And, and you know, now I look at my son, who's a, a great young guitarist, who. You know, he wants to learn something. He's he's on YouTube in yeah. seconds, and, and he's, he he knows it in half an hour. I'm like, you don't know how lucky you are. Yeah, uh, but but it's it's really cool. But yeah, it was very different back then. But I think that the you know just the accessibility of, of everything online has made it easier for us to to you know to to feel a part of that whole bluegrass scene. I guess. Yeah. Right. What was your first entry into performing bluegrass music professionally? Well, professionally, you know, I, in 1985, um, I came to America for four months, and, and I just, um, I, I'd won the Australian banjo and guitar contest okay. for, I think, three years in a row, from 1982 to 85, and we have this, like, gentleman's agreement over, if you win three years, then you, you sit back. So after 1985, they... Uh, I, I bowed out and actually became a judge for quite a few years on that event. But um, so in 1985, I hopped in on a plane and came over to America to um, to go to the uh, you know just to travel around. I just wanted to go to the as many bluegrass festivals as I could. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like that was kind of the moment for me that really went, yeah, this is this is what I love. This is this is the music that that are, that's really you know. Gets gets me going, and I so I, I went to um, places like, um, you know, obviously I've been to Telluride a few times, yeah. lucky enough to play there a few times, and and ended up in Winfield, Kansas, for the Nationals in in '85, which was awesome. Um, but I also did uh, a, a Tennessee State contest, I did the West Virginia contest, the Colorado State contest, the Rocky Mountain contest, lots of things. So. I, I had been lucky enough to hook up with Ohm Banjos out of Boulder in Colorado and and um and just going back I'd mentioned that I was a Carl Jackson, Emma Carl Jackson fan and, and I'd noticed in some, you know, nineteen eighty Fritz magazine that he had a an Ohm banjo and and so I contacted Ohm Banjos and, and this was in about nineteen eighty one okay. and said, Hey look, I'd I'd love to I'd love to buy a banjo and they sent me a catalogue in the mail, and uh, this this used to take months. Each of these correspondence <laughs> would take a few months. Yeah, and um, so so I remember Chuck Oxbury, who owns Own Banjo, sent me a letter, and he had a catalogue that looked really good, and and turned out 
that, you know, this particular banjo I wanted, of course, was the top of the range, and it was like five and a half grand US. Yeah. And at, at the time, you know, I was this broke young musician, and I just <laughs> wrote back and said, okay, well, that looks great. Um, I, I've just won the Australian Banjo Contest. I wonder, is there any kind of deal you might want to do? And, and he was great. He said, why don't you send me a, a photo and a, and a tape and a and a bio and stuff, you know, so yeah. like, I remember I made a cassette tape back then <laughs> and um, and and just put down a guitar track and then some banjo on, on a few tunes and sent it over to him and then he wrote back and said, yeah, look, we'd love to make you a banjo and, um, and so I became their kind of second endorsee, I oh, guess, yeah, if you okay. like, after Carl Jackson. So, so when I came to America in 85, I, I wanted to get to Boulder in Colorado. He offered to come stay and hang out and... Um, uh, so I came over to, to there and then just basically used Boulder as a bit of a base and then took off all over America to visit whatever whatever bluegrass festivals we could get to. And it was just such an incredible... I, I'd never heard bluegrass up close and personal like that before wow. at that level. Yeah, you know, where yeah. You can, be, you can be at Winfield, Kansas and, and be at a, a picking, you know, like campfire late night picking session and, and you know Mark O'Connor or Sam Bush walking you know it's yeah like, right you know, that that kind of thing it was like hearing those guys up close it just made everything make sense to me you know yeah yeah and I, I really appreciate and respect that about the bluegrass industry because it's still that way you, you still can can uh, you know go to a festival and and after a band's performance see one or all of the guys walking around you know, yeah. looking for something to eat or just just meeting and exactly. greeting the folks and yeah it's it's really nice that way and I, I love that about this music that everybody in it is so down to earth I mean I, I don't know many people who took up bluegrass music because they you know had dollar signs in their eyes I think it's something <laughs> that we all fall in love with yeah. and you and and you play it because you can't not you know right yeah the family atmosphere of it is, is so attractive totally yeah absolutely right yeah when you have traveled to the states to play in the past has it been from a solo perspective or do you do you bring a band with you or put a band together when you get here or how does that work for you um well for me in the past I've, I've not had the opportunity to do this as much as i'm doing right now because as, as i mentioned for years i was just a producer of, of music for other people uh -huh. and and when i came here i was normally a musical director for somebody or another I and i was putting putting bands together and 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 sometimes bringing musicians but 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 about a year ago, I decided I really wanted to make my own records, some of my own music, and and um, and that just instantly turned into a, a bluegrass record. Really, it's just I just um, wanted to do something that I really love and and would still love to listen to. I'd written these songs and didn't didn't want to um, just put them in the drawer and never listen to them. Again, yeah. You know? So yeah. Um, and and so yeah, look at. So this time around, coming over here, yeah, I've actually I've travelled over here just with my wife and my son. But I've got um, uh, some incredible musicians who are joining me. So and I feel like it's so fortunate. Like we we start playing on this week, and in the band we have guys like Stuart Duncan on fiddle. Oh great! Um, Andy, okay. Andy Leftwich and uh, Dave Pomeroy on upright bass. Yeah. Justin Moses on dobro and and. Um, and it's like, and Casey Campbell's playing some of the shows as well, and it's like, that's that's pretty fortunate. The yeah, way I look at yeah, it, you know. Yeah. So to me, those guys are kind of my musical heroes, you know. So right. To get to get to spend time in the studio with them, and then to go out and play live with them, is that's that, that's just a treat. Yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah. Did did I read where you had a connection with the band, the Green Cards? Did you were you part of them? Yeah, that's true. I, I toured with those guys for a couple of years. Um, so the Green Cards. Uh, are an odd combination of um, uh, a couple of Australians, Kim Warner and Carol Young, uh -huh. and uh, and they eventually moved from Australia over to the States. And uh, back in, in those days in Australia, Kim was um, a well-known young player, and I, I worked with him lots. In fact, I'm still you know great mates with his dad as well, who's also a great musician. Uh -huh. In fact, pretty much, I think, is one of the three guys who really brought bluegrass music back into Australia way back when in the 60s, you know, like when I was, you know, started thinking about it, he'd already been over here picking with Bill Monroe. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and uh, so so Kim had that kind of grounding and 
um, Carol was a young singer in the country scene back then in Australia. In fact, I produced her first record, and then she, her and Kim became a couple, and they just were just totally all about bluegrass and acoustic music. And yeah. They they came over here and hooked up with an odd combination. He's an Irish. Uh, fiddle player who grew up mainly in London in England and uh, these days he's in the Opry band and playing with Rodney Crowell but that's Eamon McLaughlin on the fiddle yeah, and wow. um, and so they were a great combo and they were recording over here and uh, and still doing bunches of touring so they'd fly me over to tour through the States with them or to Europe a couple of times we did and Australia of course in different places so yeah I got to play all over the States with those guys which was really good fun yeah, Did, were, were you with them when they played at uh, Merlefest? Were you part of the group then? No, no, yeah. I didn't make Merlefest, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, they, yeah, lots of other things, lots of different festivals, yeah. but not not that one. I'd love to go to Merlefest yeah. one day. It's one of those ones on my list I've never been to. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's definitely definitely one to try to make sure you get to. It's uh, it's oh, a lot yeah, of fun. That is, yeah. That yeah. is the plan for sure. Yeah. Yep. So the the new record is Fingerprints. Is this your first bluegrass record, or have there been others? It's actually my first solo record, full stop. I've never I've never made a record for myself. Okay. So um, yeah, and yes, so so yeah. Of yeah. Course it's my first bluegrass record, and uh, so much fun to make. And 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 I was kind of listening to all all my favorite Tony Rice records, and I used to listen to it and think, well, he he had these. You know, two guitar parts, and I always wondered, sounds like he probably played his first part in the track live with the band, and then he probably overdubbed the solos or something like that. It's hard, it was hard to know. I'd love to ask him that question one day if I ever get to meet him. Uh-huh. And, um, and he, and they were such amazing records. They still are. I still listen to them all the time. And so I wanted to do something similar, but what I decided to do was to, we had songs and, and basically, put down like the, the rhythm part prior to playing with the band so that when we all sat around in a room and played live together I, I could get to play all the fun parts, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh and and that's what we did and, and literally the whole album was like one and a half days of recording wow. you know, live with, cool. with the band. And it's just just so fun in that setting and and so good to hear that these amazing musicians who just bring songs to life in such a, a beautiful way. And will you? I, I'm presuming that your time here, part of that, will be able to play out with some of this music. Yeah, you bet. Well, I'm getting lucky enough to get to play at the Ivy and May. Yeah. And for me, another another dream is to to get to uh, play at the Station Inn and launch the record, which is really really cool. That's and, awesome. Um, and so yeah, with with those guys who played on the record or coming down to play, so that's that's just as I said, such a treat and. Yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to it. And and the record is available now for folks to pick up. Yeah, it actually comes out Friday, September twenty. So yeah. Oh, this week. Okay. Everybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Awesome. This week. Yeah. Cool. And wh- where can people pick it up? All the normal places, or can they get in touch with you if they want to find out where you're going to be while you're here? Yeah, they can. They can do either way. So it's available through Sonic Sonic Timber Records, which is distributed through the, uh, worldwide through MGM Distribution. So it should be in all of you know anywhere you want to order. It should be able to. Okay. Um, obviously, you can download it on on all of your favorite digital aggregators like iTunes or Spotify or whatever. And um, of course. You can, if not, you can go to my website, which is rodmccormack.com, and there's links there for ordering and all kinds of things. Many, awesome. many options. Yeah, good. Well, I certainly hope folks get a chance to hear it and, and catch you while you're here, and I, I sure look forward to uh, getting to meet you in person at IBMA here in about a week, and so um, yeah, and we'll get a chance to, to hear you live, too, there, too. So um, wish you best on, on this tour, and I and, uh, look forward to uh, how how that does for you, and and uh, I'm I'm sure it's going to be a great album for for you for your career. Uh, thank you so much, Greg. I appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in to this episode of Americana Music Profiles. Find us on iTunes at Americana Music Profiles and on the internet at americanarhythm.com. <laughs>